coming up on Mark Hamill's Pop Culture Quest. I went through this whole period. I went and bought all the stuff I owned as a kid because it was yeah. all gone. Crazy? You think I'm crazy? I'll show you who's crazy. You know, when it comes to DC Comics, I've been in love with the stories and characters for as long as I can remember. But for me, I have a certain soft spot in my heart for the Cape Crusader, Batman. Mainly because I've been trying to kill the Dork Knight for over 24 years. Buckle up, kitties, and enjoy the ride. <laughs> Welcome to Pop Culture Quest, my chance to keep collecting through you. That is awesome. I want to hear the origin stories behind the birth of your passion. We want to learn everybody's stories, okay? Exactly. We want to learn everybody's stories. So join me and my buddy Pop oh! on Mark Hamill's Pop Culture Quest. <laughs> Whoa, let's go. go. Hey there, who there, Gotham? <laughs> the bell has toiled for your own Joker TV. <laughs> I, oh, sorry, I just, <clears throat> I couldn't resist. Which issue is this? Oh, yeah, it's from the Batman animated series. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was the first Joker I did. I know, I know, yeah. How would you read that? Well, I don't know if I can do the voice. I need, I need inspiration. Hey, I know the perfect person to inspire us. Who? Jim Lee. Shut up. No, I know Jim Lee. I've met him several times. He's a really nice guy and such an amazing artist. You can just email him. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, I can't believe I'm going to email Jim Lee. <laughs> Might be out of a job. Oh, how do you do that? Oh. Long before I became Joker on Batman the Animated Series, I was a huge fan of the DC Universe, especially the artwork. Oh my gosh. This is fantastic. DC Comics. Visiting the DC headquarters is certainly on my bucket list, but I wanted to take it a step further. On this quest, I want to see Jim Lee, the master himself, draw before my very eyes. I guess I'll have to play my cards just right. <laughs> I don't know if you're allowed to play these, but they look practical, don't they? Look at these costumes. You wonder, what does a costume like this weigh for Christian Bale to wear 14 hours a day for months on end? And one key question, does it contain a catheter? Which I would demand in my contract. Hello, I'm here to see Jim Lee. Perfect. Very exciting. Do I need to call hey, security? Hey, how I know. Are you? <laughs> good, 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 good. good to see you. I was just saying how astonishing your offices are. As a kid, I dreamed of what the DC and Marvel offices must look like. Sure, sure. The bullpen. No, I, yeah. So this oh, is my great. office here. So yeah, they say I would look like a hoarder. I've actually cleaned it up a little bit. Wow. But, uh, so your oldest is 23. Yes. I was thinking, what a great job for, if my dad had worked, my dad was a career naval officer. Right. So nepotism would only help me if I wanted to join the Navy. Sure, yes. I would have given anything to have a dad <laughs> like you. Right, but you know what? She works for the Department of Justice. Oh! So she wants to go to law school. So thematically, <laughs> you're linked. <laughs> Well, speaking of cool jobs, let's meet the guy with the ultimate job. Let me introduce you to Benjamin LeClear, the official archivist and a walking encyclopedia of all things DC. One of the most important pieces of comic book history is the birth of Robin. Here he is in Detective Comics 38, so just 11 months later after Batman's first appearance. While I'm catching up with Jim, Benjamin will be flaunting the DC family jewels. Well, this is where we keep all of our treasures. Not only do we have comics both bound and loose that goes back for 80 years, we keep some of our best pieces inside this case. 
Here's the house copy of Action Comics number one, the birth of the genre of superheroes. But right now we're focusing on Batman, so let's take us all the way down to the bottom of the case here. You can see the house copy of Detective Comics number 27. That's a very valuable comic, so we protect it with something. We keep Michelle Pfeiffer's whip, Catwoman's whip, around it at all times. One thing I love about these offices yeah. are the toys. Everywhere yeah, you look, <laughs> accumulated junk and debris. Candy. Right. Like, yeah. So these are all uh, things that DC that we sell through DC collectibles. Okay. But these are ones I actually designed. So I did oh. the sketch that inspired the actual sculpt. I've got too much stuff now at this point, right? So you have to be kind of picky what you actually choose to bring home, what goes on the mantle above the fireplace. Um, but for the most part, it's toys and things that meant something to me as a kid. Things I either couldn't get or I had that I completely destroyed because I played with it over and over again. I went through this whole period when I, I was um, make some decent money, I went and bought all the stuff I owned as a kid because it was yeah. all gone, yeah. right? And, right? And so I got this Corgi Batmobile. I loved the show and uh, obviously it wasn't meant in How box How old like this. were you when you had this originally? Uh, it probably was like uh, six or seven at okay. the time. And what's the original price? Well, I bought it for 75, it says 100, but I it says $100? Yeah, $100 back in the day. And then this now, one. this originally probably was sold for like $3.98 or Yeah, yeah, I'm mm -hmm. sure, sure. And then so this one here, this is actually by uh, a famous Lego artist named uh, Nathan Sawaya. Okay. And, he, and he signed it. Yeah, he signed it. It's so a one of 50. It's a small replica of a Batmobile we worked on together. So I designed this Batmobile actually at San Diego Comic Con. And then in his studio, he built a life-size version of this. Out of Legos? Yeah, out of Legos. And they have, it separates into four parts so they can get it through doorways. And then they reassemble it. And it is just a monster. I of, love uh, hearing about this because it puts your own sort of peccadillos into proportion. Sure, sure, you yeah, know, right, I right. know I have some weird habits in right. terms of collecting. Yeah. Uh, I don't have to disassemble anything into four pieces. Right. And speaking of Legos, <laughs> show them what's in the lobby, Benjamin. We have a Lego Batman, not the Lego Batman from the movie, but uh, Jim drew a beautiful picture of Batman for a celebration we had, and a Lego artist took the individual bricks and was able to recreate all the drip. So you've got both Jim Lee and Lego art combined together into this fantastic piece. You can see that we've actually been in business for over 80 years making comic books even before we made superheroes. Of course, Batman's the most important superhero to most people. Uh, this is his debut in Detective Comics 27, so he's been with us well over 75 years. For so many people, the animated series is what introduced them to Batman and the entire DC Universe. This is fantastic because obviously we have an incredible image from it, but look, it's signed by Batman and Mark Hamill, the Joker himself. And then, we get this lovely piece over here. <laughs> when was the first time you drew the Joker? Was it Hush? Uh, it was. In fact, the way I've drawn him has evolved over the years. And so I actually have the original board here. Oh, you do? The very first Joker I did kind of has that feels kind of a longer, thinner nose. Kind of a praying mantis vibe yeah, about right, him. Right. What I like about the Joker always that he was the exact opposite of, of, of Batman, but he was also very wiry. Yeah. and crazy, and then you knew he had sort of the psychotic strength that kind of flowed through these very thin limbs of his. Uh, the big bow tie, and then in the uh, and then in the graffiti throughout the issue, I put different uh, creators' King, names. Yeah. Exactly. So. Sprang. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I didn't know uh, Jerry Robinson. That's right. That's right. Sheldon Maldock. Yes. Right? All right. Okay. <laughs> Let me see if there's any I don't. You, I, you know, if you know your comics history. If I do know my comics history. You've lived it, because I remember seeing on Twitter you posted a picture. I mean, you were, it well, looked like you were a teenager or maybe in your early 20s at the time. When you think in terms of Jack Kirby, Bob Kane, right. and Jerry Siegel, in animation terms, it'd be like Walt Disney, sure, yeah, Max yeah, Fleischer, yeah, yeah. and who? Walter right. Lance yeah, yeah. or something, all right. in one room. Fantastic. Just being in the DC office, well, it's stirring up all my pent-up knowledge of comic books from my collecting days. Aside from having original artwork from a slew of legendary comic book artists, they also have original design work from the DC Cinematic Universe. Well, these are obviously just amazing pieces all on their own, but they're a great part of Batman's history. These are the original sketches of Gotham City by designer Anton Furst. They were done for the Batman movie with Michael Keaton uh, by Tim Burton, 
and they were meant to also be a reference for future comic books for what Gotham City looked like. The Batman and DC universe have been shaped by the hands of extremely talented artists. And while I was actually sitting with one of them, I couldn't pass on an opportunity. Uh, so I feel hesitant, but I would love to see you draw. I would love to, man. What if we did a trade? What's that trade? If you could do the Joker and do it on my voicemail for my phone, I will <laughs> gladly draw you and gift you a sketch. Well, that's, oh my gosh. Yes. Well, listen, I have to warn you, the last time I did this for a DC employee was yes. Mike Carlin in New York. Okay. They said, oh yeah, it was great fun, but we had to disconnect it after about a week and a half because uh, people would call in, just hear the message, <laughs> and then hang up. So. So a lot of this is just obviously to, it's a gestural type drawing, but also doing some slight rendering. It basically creates some blueprints so that when I draw, I feel like I'm doing it with somewhat of a safety net. People ask me, like they say, where did you come up with the Joker's voice? Right. And I don't remember consciously thinking of it at the time, but in retrospect, I'm thinking it must have something to do with Claude Rains in The Invisible Man. Because I loved all the universal horror pictures, yeah, and I was so enamored of these various sounds. Crazy? You think I'm crazy? I'll show you who's crazy. And so there's that grit and that sort of uh, in intimidating scariness of the voice. Right. I said, well, that's a good foundation to start with. And then if we can make him sort of mid-Atlantic because he's flamboyant and has that sort of theatrical uh, side of him. Okay, now what are you doing? I'm going to, um, so I like to, <laughs> it's a Kleenex and uh, black indie ink, and it allows you to create these uh, kind of cool, subtle gray textures. So this is a whiteout, it's a Pentel whiteout pen. I don't think it was meant for drawing per se, but uh, you that's might what be the first, you're a yeah. pioneer. So these are wisps of his hair flying into the... That's right. So basically when I put the black in there, it gives me the contrast so that when I do this, it really pops out, right? If I didn't have that black background, it right, would be right. hard to really kind of capture this. But wait, one more. Ha, huh, ha. Huh. Wait. <laughs> put it right before handle. There no, that's what I'm saying. Well, that was what I was trying to do, and then I realized it doesn't work because I went to the next that's line. That's So great. that was the... This whole show would have been a ploy for me to just to get <laughs> this piece of art. Truly, right. I mean, it's that fantastic. I mean, it's so beyond great. Joker here. <laughs> there he is, the, the man himself. Well, mission accomplished. But before I hold up my end of the bargain, let's meet up with Benjamin for a closer look at the vault. I used to passionately argue that, you know, at eight years old, that Batman is much more realistic than Superman. I said, look, Superman's like an alien from another planet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, th this could happen. Yeah. If you had a millionaire, which of course now it'd have to be a billionaire, yeah, right. but if you had a millionaire that was determined, he yes. could build his body up and, and develop his intellect like Sherlock Holmes, and you know, even if he didn't have a cave, a natural cave, he could dig the cave, he's a millionaire. <laughs> There's original artwork by Jack Kirby, Oh, yeah. Animation cells from Max Fleischer. These are actually from uh, the test reel. You know, the colors on this, the painting, the stuff oh, they used to, you know, I mean, you know. More number ones and first appearances than any collector could ever own. They even had the alternate ending to the Death in the Family series, where voters got to choose whether Robin lived or died. All right. All right, so they're known for the oh, alternates. Oh, he's alive. Yeah, right, Had the vote right. gone differently, you can see Jim Aparo had prepared an alternate ending where Jason Todd survives. It seems so arbitrary to me. I remember when this happened, mm -hmm. I didn't call in, right. but I remember saying, I'm surprised, mm -hmm. I thought for sure, that they'd vote for him to live. It was 28 votes. That's the Is difference. Is that what it was? Oh, yeah. And you hear people, they go, oh, I said, why'd you vote for him to die? I go, well, he got on my nerves. <laughs> he was too cocky right. or just something yeah. so arbitrary. Really? Yeah. You're gonna kill a guy because he's got a bad attitude? Yeah. I don't want you to be a father. It was a precursor to the internet, I think. Uh, yeah, internet. interactive. That's right. Boy, I gotta tell you, this was a bit of a dream come true for me. 
to be able to rummage through and touch comic book history in the house that was built on the backs of Titans. I want to thank Jim Lee and everyone at DC Comics for inviting us into their archives. Oh my gosh, when it comes to Batman, we only scratched the surface. This should have been a two-part. Oh, well, we'll do another episode somewhere down the line. And hey, how did you like me getting this one-of-a-kind Jim Lee original Joker for a simple Joker voicemail? <laughs> <laughs> One take! Oh, I got the best of that bargain, don't you think? All right. Nice All right, Brie, 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 here's a Heimlich. <laughs> All right. Are you better now? Yeah, much. I hope you're better too, and we'll see you next time on PCQ. Bye! Okay, here we go. So, you wanted to speak with Jim Lee? <laughs> he can't come to the phone right now, and the reason is multiple choice. Is it A, his nine children? Is it B, his notorious struggle with deadlines? Or C, I've got him bound and gagged, dangling over a man of acid? <laughs> you be the judge. Is that too long? I know, that was awesome. Next week on Mark Hamill's Pop Culture Quest. I have to totally believe 1980s was the greatest generation for toys and pop culture. There is a Shogun Godzilla in the room. If you pull it, it could break. Ready? Well, don't, don't break it. <laughs>